I want to thank you and uh, my, my, my partner in crime, Beth Sargent, and the Florida Club Manor Association for sponsoring these webinars that we've been doing for the past uh, couple of years uh, through COVID and now beyond. Mm -hmm. And we've had some incredible leaders and authors and CEOs join us every month uh, teaching us about heart-led leadership. And when you say um, we, we, we have one of the best ones today, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really take that lightly. When you say the word uh, Ken Blanchard, uh, the best uh, really comes to mind. Um, if you look him up on Google, you would see that um, no one has sold more business books and leadership books in the world than, than Ken Blanchard. He's written over seven or 60 books in career and his greatest book, the, the One Minute Manager, sold over 15 million copies. And he's just been a legend in the business. And he's founded the Ken Blanchard companies with his wife, Margie, and um, management training and consulting company and just really uh, changed the needle um, on leadership uh, in corporate America and in the world uh, through the last you know five decades. But what makes Ken Blanchard so special is not his accolades of and his books and his book sales. It's his genuine heart. You know, one of the things I've learned about leadership over the last 20, 30 years is the more success that you have, the more arrogant you become. And success and arrogance are almost at a pinnacle together. And I believe true heart-led leaders, true servant leaders, the more success you have, the more humble and the more genuine you become. And when you meet the likes of Ken Blanchard, um, that's, that's, that's really true. And I'm not sure about the club business. I, I've met many general managers that have a humble, genuine heart. And I've met some general managers that, that don't have that genuine, humble heart. And it's the same in my business, the authors and speakers. Um, some write amazing books, but yet they're kind of full of themselves and they have that, that arrogant heart. And then there's those that great, write great books and have that great heart. And Ken Blanche is one of those people. He's just the most genuine, humble, um, caring person. And um, he wrote the forward to my first book. He's been a mentor, a dear friend father figure been there every step of the way for me over my 15 year career and I love him uh, like as a human being and when Ken you know was looking at his career he was thinking about putting a kind of a greatest hits books he's written over 60 books but had he put all these like these these leadership lessons these simple truths together in one book and he tapped Randy Conley who's been his lieutenant for 26 years r r running the um, Ken Blanchard companies, you know, over the last 26 years and really focusing on the, the subject of trust because you can't have heart that leadership. You can't have servant leadership without trust. And so Ken and Randy teamed up and built this book and wrote this book it just came out called Simple Truths of Leadership that we're going to talk about today. And Ken and Randy, I want to thank you so much for serving the Florida Club Mountain Association, sharing your wisdom. And um, I want to thank you so much for writing such a profound book. Well, Tommy, thank you. And that uh, introduction was a little over the t top. I, I'm going to send a copy of that to my kids and all that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that was recorded, wasn't it, Ken? Because I, yeah. I, I want to keep that too. <laughs> but uh, it's great to, great to be with you. And it's been really fun to work with Randy over these years. And, and I've been a big uh, fan of servant leadership and been pushing that. And what really became clear to me is that servant leaders build trust and people who are trustworthy usually are servant leaders and so when we decided to put this book together it uh, the subtitle the title is simple truths of leadership 52 ways to become a servant leader and build trust is randy's become a you know international expert on trust and so it became really clear why did we do this uh together and so uh that's what we're going to be talking to. And, and when we talk about servant leadership, there's really a lot of misconceptions of, about it, isn't it, Randy? I mean, a lot of people think it's about the inmates running the prison or trying to please everybody or some religious movement. But there's really two parts of servant leadership. There's the direct directive vision, values, and, and all, because leadership's about going somewhere. And uh, that's the function of the hierarchy. It doesn't mean you don't involve your people, but if people don't know what they're being asked to do and what good behavior looks like, then shame on you because that's that's your responsibility. And then once the, the servant leadership uh, 
the leadership part of server leadership is underway. Then you turn the pyramid upside down and now you're to the <clears throat> servant part. And now your job is to help people win, help them accomplish their goals. And so that's really what we're trying to do, isn't it, Randy, is to help people uh, help their people win. We, we believe in we rather than me when it comes to leadership. Yes, that's right, Ken. And, you know, when Tommy was opening the session, uh, his words about, you know, the correlation between the higher leaders go in organizations, often the, the ego climbs at a similar rate. And it was making me think that the furthest distance that a leader will ever have to travel is the 18 inches between their head and their heart, right? I, people have You've probably heard that saying before, the furthest distance we'll have to travel as a leader is the 18 inches between our head and our heart. And Ken and I truly believe that um, trusted servant leaders are the answer to today's most pressing leadership challenges. And, um, but in order to do that, we have to get our egos out of the way. We think our ego is probably the biggest temptation and challenge that we face. And so one of the simple truths in our book is this one right here, number 16. Ken, would you like to share uh, this simple truth and share your thoughts about the importance of humility and what that really means in terms of being a, a servant leader? Yes, there's two ways that your ego gets in a way. And we started a 12-step Egos Anonymous program. It's really kind of <laughs> fun to see some of our clients, you know, when they meet with their people, they start off with an Egos Anonymous meeting. And it's uh, like an AA meeting because it's voluntary, but you stand up and you say, hi, I'm Ken. And what does everybody say? I can. I can. <laughs> yeah. I'm an egomaniac. And the last time my ego got in the way was, and there's two ways your ego get in the way is one is false pride. When you have a more than philosophy, you think you're brighter than, smarter than and all. Uh, <clears throat> and then the other one is, a fear of self-doubt, where you have a less than philosophy, uh, you know, you think you're not as smart of us and all that. And a lot of people, you know, understand that false pride is an ego problem. They don't have an understanding that why fear and self-doubt is. And yet when you're fearful and doubtful, what are you focusing on? You're focusing on yourself. Mm -hmm. And the anecdote for false pride is this one, humility. And a lot of times people think people with humility, that that's a weakness, you know, but this is a, a, a saying, you know, credited to C.S. Lewis, Rick Warren, I even get credit sometimes, but people with humility don't think less of themselves, they just think about themselves less. And that's that we rather than me uh, uh, philosophy. And the way we overcome the fear of self-doubt is to trust the unconditional love of God, because God didn't make any junk. That, that we're all beautiful in our own way. And we have to trust uh, that that beauty <clears throat> really worth something and that we are have something to contribute. So those are the two areas, but humility is a really biggie here, uh, Randy. Yeah, we're, we're both fans of Jim Collins, who uh, if you've heard of the book, Good to Great, that's one of Jim's uh, best works. And he talks about level five leadership. And in that book, Good to Great. And in many ways, a level five leader in, in Jim's uh, writings is, is very much a servant leader. It's a leader who, who um, has this super focus on achieving results, but yet they lead with humility and they understand their proper place um, you know, within the world and in their organization. And Collins has this, um, this image of level five leaders or trusted servant leaders, when things go right with their team, they look out the window and they give the praise to their team. They give the team all the credit. But when things go wrong, those same leaders look in the mirror and they say, wow, what did I do or not do to set my people up for success? And I think that's a great image of humility and practice, right, Ken? Because you're, yeah. you're acknowledging people when they do things right, but yet you're really looking inward 
if things don't go as, as, as planned. And the big ego people, <clears throat> when <clears throat> things go right, they look in the mirror and they bang themselves on the chest. Exactly. When things it, go wrong, they look out the window and blame everybody else. It's you're a, right. High ego right. leaders do just the opposite of that. So we'd like to uh, get you involved in the chat here. So uh, limber up those fingers. You see three words on the screen here, results and relationship. Type in the chat, which of these words do you think is most important when it comes to being a successful leader? So we wanna see what you put in the chat here. Go ahead and uh, find your chat box, open it up and type in there what you think is the most important, results and relationships. What's the most important here? All right, Ken, we're getting a lot of people saying relationships, not surprising given the, the topic we're talking about, right? Heart-led yeah. leadership. Lots of relationships. Oh, someone throws in honesty and transparency. Ian, you're breaking the rules there. I said, you know, which of these three words on the screen and you're making up your own words. I'm just <laughs> messing with you, Ian. <clears throat> We always have someone who colors outside the lines, right, Ken? There's always, you know. That's right. Yep, that would be you, Ian. Okay, we, we, we see you. Well, we're getting a lot of people on relationships there. Evo adds meaningful relationships. Okay, good. All right. I love to ask this question uh, because inevitably, you know, part of the crowd will say results right? We're leaders. It's all about getting results. Scoreboard, baby. What's the number on the scoreboard, right? That's why we're in business. And then we have uh, another chunk of folks who say, well, no, I think relationships is the most important, right? Because if we don't have good relationships, as, as Sean says in the chat there, if we don't have good relationships, we're not going to get good results. And it's a bit of a trick question because the most important word on there is the word in the middle, and, the power of and. And I think that illustrates this next simple truth. Ken, you, we let our book off with this one, number one. Yes, yeah, servant leadership is the best way to achieve both great results and great relationships. <clears throat> it's a both and uh, philosophy. And because of the leadership part of servant leadership, the focus is on results and accomplishing those goals and living according to those values. But how do you do it? By turning the pyramid upside down. And now you work for your people. They don't work for you. Your job is to help them win, help them accomplish the goals. So what happens is you get both results and relationships. And when I was a college professor, <coughs> I was always in trouble because mm -hmm. the first day of class, I always gave out the final examination. And the rest of the faculty would say, what are you doing? I'd say, I'm confused. You say, you acted. I thought you were supposed to teach these kids. I, we are. Uh, and that's why I give them the finals at the first day of class. And what do you think I do all semester? I teach them the answers. So when they get to the finals, they get A. Life's about getting A. It's not some stupid normal distribution curve. If any of you out there have a system where you, you make your people screw a certain percentage of their people into a normal distribution curve, you got to be crazy. I mean, how many of you go out and hire losers? We lost some of our best losers from last year. We need to go out and hire some new <laughs> losers to fill the low slots. No, you hire winners who steal from other country clubs or, and all, or you hire potential winners you think can really go. And so you really are helping make winners. And it's a both end uh, philosophy. And uh, Gary Ridge is the president of WD40. We have a master's degree program at the University of San Diego started over 20 years ago and Gary was in the first class and he went, duh, you know, why don't we do that? In fact, this is the title that, 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 uh, that uh, Randy and I wanted for this a book initially, duh, why isn't common sense common practice? But the publisher says does, duh doesn't publish, I mean, translate in a lot of yeah. foreign countries. And, uh, but Gary said, wow, uh, boy, I, I need to give the final exam ahead of time and help people win. And so in his company, uh, everybody's job is to help their people get A's, get, get straight A's, get, accomplish their goals. 
And you know, the last time they did it, they had a 92% employee engagement score. WD-40, unbelievable. Not amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, Gary is a great example of, of servant leadership and action. And people often ask Ken and I, you know, they'll say, well, give us some examples of companies or leaders that are great servant leaders and and our our favorite response is well all, only the best companies you know and only the best leaders you look at people like um you know uh howard bihar who was the president of starbucks or howard schultz from starbucks joel peterson at JetBlue, uh doug conant who was the ceo of uh <clears throat> Campbell's, Campbell's Soup. Uh, so there's a lot of great leaders out there. And as Ken was saying earlier, this is one of the myths about servant leadership is that servant leadership is all about the warm and fuzzy relationships, right? And yes, it is that. And the power of and, it's about achieving results because what do servant leaders do? Servant leaders want the best for their people. They also want the best for their organization. Servant leaders are stewards of the organization. So we as servant leaders would be doing a disservice to our organization if we were not focused on achieving results. That's part of our responsibility. And we do it through and with our people. So it's a both and. Uh, we can't give preference to either one. Ken, the simple truth, number five from our book, I know you have said many, many times that you really want this to be your lasting legacy, right? That if, if, uh, if they were to take away everything from what you've taught over the last 40 years, this would be the message that you would want to keep and hold on to. Do you want to share the power of this simple truth? <clears throat> yes, that's a servant leader. Once the vision, direction, values, and goals are clear, your job is to wander around <coughs> and, <coughs> excuse me, and catch your people doing things right, you know, and because there's three parts of managing people's performance, performance planning, where you set goals and objectives, there's day-to-day -day coaching, where you help them accomplish those goals, and there's performance evaluation. When you ask most people, most organization of those three parts of performance management, which you spend the most time on, most people say what? Evaluation. Why? Because they're filling out these stupid forms all the time mm -hmm. and uh, and all. Don't fill out forms of your people. Let them fill them out and you agree or disagree. But your job is to, is to help them win. And if you set goals that are observable and measurable and you both are able to observe, as you wander around, you can say, Alec, I was looking at the numbers in this area. Wow, they're really going in the direction we want. And you had a boy. Keep up the good work. Or Alice, I was watching this and got saw your report on on that particular project. Wow, I'm really excited. Uh, you know, good work uh, and uh, catch them doing something right. If if something isn't going quite right, you don't beat them up. You do what we call redirection. Because when we rewrote the one minute manager a few years ago, we changed one minute reprimand to one minute redirects. And all you do is you say, "Gee, John." Uh, the performance in this area doesn't seem to be moving in the direction we had talked about. What can I do to help you get back on track? That's a, a redirection because you're there for me. You say, I'm, I'm still in your corner. Uh, it's, it's, it's great. So uh, you catch people doing things right and redirect them when they're not. Yeah. There's a, when I work with groups, I'll often ask people, I'll, I'll say, raise your hand and I'll ask you folks. Raise your hand or, or use your chat emoticons. Give me the thumbs up in the chat if you are sick and tired of all the praise that you get at work. Go ahead. I'm closely watching the chat. I'm, who gets too much praise at work? Nobody, right? Nobody ever raises their hand when I ask that question. People are starving for praise and recognition. And one of the easiest the most effective ways that um, a heart-led leader, a servant leader can build trust and commitment and loyalty with their people is to catch them doing something right. It's common sense, right, Ken? I mean, we do that as parents. 
We do it uh, with our pets, right? Why would we yeah. not do it with people at work? Catch them doing something right. That's for sure. It's 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 uh, it's so powerful, and that's one of the key things. One of the things you'll find in this book, the <clears throat> subtitle title is "52 Ways," as I said, to be a servant leader and build trust. And there's 26 on servant leadership, and then 26 on trust. And I kind of lead the way on the servant leadership 26, and Randy on the on the trust. But they go together like what do you say? Peanut butter and jelly, like right? Peanut butter and jelly, right? <laughs> Baseball in America, mom and apple pie, trust yeah. and servant leadership, they just go together. Yeah. That's right. Well, in order for someone to really um, be an effective servant leader and achieve both results and relationships, it's really important that they understand how to flex their leadership style, right? Ken, you know, based on the needs of the situation. So yeah. Simple truth number 10. Would you like to share that? Yeah, that's all about our SL2 uh, model, which is our approach to situational leadership. And you not only you need to use different strokes for different folks, you know, because everybody's not the same, but it's really important to understand you need to use different strokes for the same folks on different parts of their job. Because the first thing, once you set a goal with people, in, in the performance planning is analyze their development level. What is their competence and commitment already to be able to accomplish that goal? If they have already high commitment and high competence, you can delegate to them. But if they're an enthusiastic beginner, you know, they have uh, commitment, but not competence. They need direction. You know, if they're disillusioned learning, they need coaching, both direction and support. If they're capable, but cautious, uh, meaning that they, they got the skills, but they still don't want to be left alone, you give them a supportive leadership style. And then if they're uh, peak performers, you can delegate to them. So uh, it's not only different strokes for different folks, but on different goals, people on a finance goal might really be a winner because they've been doing finance stuff for a long time, but their people skills might need some coaching and all. So it's different strokes for different folks, but importantly, different strokes for the same folks on different parts of their job. Right. And that's where uh, I think servant leadership really comes alive, Ken. This is the day-to-day -day implementation of servant leadership because you've already set the vision, the goals, the direction. Here's where we're going. And here's how I come alongside you and support you on a daily basis, right? I I That's diagnose right. your development level on a goal or a task. And based on where you're at, then I tailor my leadership style to give you the right amount of direction and support that you need on that particular goal or task. That's right. That's for sure. Yeah. So th those are really the important, uh, some of the simple truths around leadership. Let's move to trust now, Randy, and see what we can share a couple of the secrets of that. Yeah, let's do that. And as we transition into talking a little bit more about trust, once again, want to engage you in the chat. So I want you to think of your best boss, best boss you've ever had. Go ahead and type in the chat, what were the characteristics of that person? What did that person say or do that made them your best boss? Let's see what kind of characteristics describe your best boss okay lauren says they encouraged growth right they challenged you to expand your capabilities pamela mutual trust there there was that sense of safety and honesty between you and the boss that you knew you could admit that you needed help and, and your boss wouldn't hold that against you right uh, mentoring, receptive to input, right? They asked your feedback. They incorporated your ideas. Daniela says engaged, supportive, gave feedback and praise. Dan, constructive feedback. Terry, teacher, honest, loyal, always open door. Seeing several open doors. Great listeners. Continuous feedback and support. <clears throat> a great counselor, flexible. Yes, they were your partner. Yes, you probably 
felt like you worked with them rather than for them, right? They were your partner. They challenged you, but they were supportive also. I would argue that all of those things underlying all those characteristics is trust. Trust is the foundation of any healthy and successful relationship. And the cool thing is trust is actually a skill that can be learned and developed. And so simple truth number 28 in our book uh, says exactly that. Building trust is a skill that can be learned and developed. And when you learn that there are four distinct elements of trust, then you can start to use the behaviors that align with those elements of trust and people will perceive you to be trustworthy. You will build trust with others. So Ken, Ken uh, knows very well, we have a, a model, we lovingly call it the ABCDs of trust that describe those four elements. Ken, would you mind sharing what those four elements are? And I'll, I'll expand on them a little bit. Yeah, A stands for ability. You know, Do you trust the person's competence and skills in an area? B is, are they believable? You know, the, do they do what they say? Do they walk their talk? Uh, C is connectedness. You know, that, how do they feel? Do they reach out to, to people? And then finally, D is dependable. You know, can you count on them? You know, if you ask them to do something, can you count on them to follow through? That's so, right. And th those are the ABCDs of trust. Able, believable, connected, and dependable. So I would encourage you to write those down able, believable, connected, dependable. And the key to building trust is to use behaviors that demonstrate your ability, believability, connectedness, and dependability. And that's uh, because trust is based on perceptions. And those perceptions are formed by the behaviors we use. And so we all have slightly different ideas of what trust looks like you know, based on our early childhood experiences and our own values and our, our role models. But when we can get all of our teams speaking the same language of trust, if we all look to the ABCDs as our common model of trust, then we're, we're all talking the same language of trust, so to speak. And that's when we really unlock the power of trust in our teams. This next, Simple truth, Ken, is one of my favorites, number 30. And it says, someone must make the first move to extend trust. Leaders, you go first. You know, Ken and I, as we've worked with groups over the years, we've noticed that uh, a lot of leaders, just by virtue of their title or position, think that they should be trusted, right? Just automatically, because my name's on the door in the corner office, you should trust me. And it's actually the opposite. Leaders need to first extend trust to those that they lead. And then your people will reciprocate and give their trust back to you in return. So Ken, when you think of this simple truth about the importance of leaders going first, what, what does that really bring to mind for you? Well, it really means that, that as a leader, your job is to reach out to your people and, and make it clear to them is that this is a team. Uh, uh, I'm not perfect. I, I don't even have all the answers. But together, one plus one is a lot greater than two. Uh, and, and we really feel that uh, none of us is as smart as all of us. And uh, it, it begins with me trusting you and you trusting me, and together, boy, we're going to be some team. That's right. And if when you think about it, you know, the, the very nature of trust itself means risk is involved, right? Risk is involved. If there's no need to take a risk, there's no need for trust, right? Like if, if we were all in Vegas, and we walked into a casino, and we saw a game that we were guaranteed to win, we play that all day long, right? Because there's no risk uh, involved. But when there's a risk of 
extending your time, your effort, your money, your heart, your emotions. Well, unless someone makes that first move, you're just at a stalemate, right? You're the other person's waiting for the other person to make the first move. And in the world of leadership, leaders have to go first to extend trust to their people. And that means getting comfortable with not being in control. Simple truth number 45. Um, the, the common sense principle here that we're trying to get at is most people think the opposite of trust is distrust. And that's not the case. The opposite of trust is control. Think about that. The opposite of trust is control. When we're not trusting someone, what do we want to do? We want to play our cards close to the vest, right, Ken? We want to keep things within our control. We don't want to extend too much information or share information with people because we're not comfortable with what they may or may not do. So we really have to get comfortable with the idea of not always being in control. In fact, your goal as a, as a leader is to get your people in as many goals that they have as possible where they're self-directed uh, uh, leaders and they're self-directed and they, they have the control. And when they have the control, you know what? It's best for you. It's best for them. It's best for the organization. It's a, it's a triple win and the customers. That is it's true. That, that, is, that is so true. When you, when you really think about it, leadership is all about, over time, giving away your control and power to other people to help them be self-reliant, right? That's the whole word, empowering, giving power to others so that they are in control of achieving the goal. Mm -hmm. That's uh, in control of achieving the goal. Does that sound familiar, Ken? That sounds pretty good. <laughs> that's, uh, that's one of his secrets from his book, uh, Gung Ho, right? Being in control right. of the goal. That's right. Yeah, for sure. So people need to feel like they have a chance to really run with the ball. That's right. The ball. This next simple truth is the one we kind of end with. And it's pretty powerful, isn't it, Randy? It sure is. You, you know, and it, and it ended up being so timely as we've dealt with COVID, you know, the pandemic over the last couple of years, because we've noticed that a lot of people are holding on, you know, to frustrations, to pain, to the challenges that we've all experienced the last couple of years. And that really weighs you down. You know, that puts a large burden on your shoulders. And this simple truth says, forgiveness is letting go of all hope for a better past. You know, we cannot change the past. It's happened, right? No matter how much we ruminate on it, how much we hold on to things, uh, we can't change it. And when it comes to relationships and restoring trust in relationships, there's this fallacy that by somehow not forgiving someone is keeping something from them that they really need to move on. And, and it's not true. Those other people, they're off living their life, right? They're, they've moved on. And when we choose not to forgive, we're only hurting ourselves. <laughs> and so when we can, um, from a spiritual perspective, um, you know, when you realize how much you've been forgiven, it's only natural that you would want to extend that same amount of forgiveness to others. And so when, when you can muster up the emotional courage to forgive others, it releases the weight off your shoulders and it allows you to move forward in a much more healthy and proactive way. Because we can't always control what happens to us but we can control what happens within us. And forgiveness lies completely within each of us. So how about, can we wrap up this portion and then we'll open it up for some questions, but this is one of your and I's mutually favorite simple truths that we borrowed from our friend, Rick Warren. Yes, and, and that, that, that's just something we've talked about, we rather than me, but just remember that leadership is not about you. 
It's about the people that you're working. It's about we. How can you do things to, to, together? You need to get out of your own way, get your ego under control, to realize that you and your people together uh, are a lot stronger than separate. Well said, well said. So Ken and I would love to connect with you. Uh, here's all of our contact information up here. You can connect with us on Twitter at Ken Blanchard or at Randy Conley. There's our LinkedIn information. Feel free to take a picture of this or a screenshot. We'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn. You can hit our website there, kenblanchard.com. Or if you'd like to learn more about the book, uh, go to simpletruthsofleadership.com. There's a little video there from Ken and I talking about the book. You can download a sample chapter if you'd like to give it a little test run before you invest uh, your money in it. We think it's well worth uh, your time and your money. A lot of people are having fun, Randy, with the book because there's 52 truths and you know, you could take one a week with your people That's right. and, uh, and go over it and, and all or whatever. And so these simple truths, if you shared them with your people over time, you'd really have a language that is one where we're in this thing together. Yeah, that's right. We've had a number of organizational presidents and other leaders say they're just emailing out one simple truth a week to their team and they're engaging in dialogue about it. There's also a discussion guide in the back of the book that if you want to run like a book club meeting or in your staff meeting, you want to pick a particular simple truth or a discussion question to uh, talk about as a, as a teaching or a learning tool for your staff, it's a great resource for that. So we've really enjoyed being with you. We're going to stop sharing our PowerPoint now and open it up for questions, invite Tommy back on and uh, uh, we hope that that was time worthwhile for all of you. Thank you, Ken. And thank you, Randy. Uh, you know, I'm a fan of, of your work and read most of all your books. And, and the simple truth that, in my opinion, it really is your greatest hits because mm -hmm. I see every uh, great book that you have, whether it's Raving Fans or Gung Ho or Leading at a Higher Level, Situational Leadership, Well Done, One Minute Manager, they're all in the, in the simple truth. So, yeah. um, you know, Frank Sinatra has the greatest hits and you know, Bill <laughs> has the greatest hits and so can Ken Blanchard. That's right. That's right. This, this is our greatest hits. We're going to really we're gonna, go. We're going to open up for Q&A. We have a few minutes left for Q&A. So if anyone has a question, please text it in. But I would like to um, just ask one question. You know, Ken, your, your book, uh, The One Minute Manager, is often said that the greatest leadership book of all time and obviously sold the most copies of any leadership book of all time. I'd love you to just kind of give an overview of, of that book and why do you think it, why do you think it did so well so long ago? What, what did that book um, share to the world that was different than any other book? Well, it's interesting. I, I met uh, Spencer Johnson at a cocktail party and he wrote children's books with his wife, the, the Value Tales series, The Value of Courage, The Story of Jackie Robinson, The Value yeah. of Determination, The Story of Helen Keller. And Margie, my wife, <laughs> did it first and she said, Bring them over. She says, you guys ought to write a children's book for managers. They won't read anything else. <clears throat> and Spencer was writing a one minute scolding at the time on how to discipline kids. And I invited him to a seminar where he's doing the next week. And he sat in the back and laughed. He came running up at the end. He said, forget parenting. Let's do the one minute manager. And so uh, I talked about one minute goal setting. You know, we've talked about catching people doing things right. One minute praisings. And he had in his scolding, the one minute reprimand. And so uh, we thought those were the key basic things. And we rewrote the reprimand, as I said, to one minute redirect. So you wanna be clear with your people on what the goals are. And then you turn the pyramid upside down and you work with them and you praise their progress. You redirect them if they're not going in the right direction. You're on their team with the goal of getting them an A average. Uh, at Gary Ridge and I at WD40, we wrote a book called Help People Win at Work and listen to the subtitle, a business philosophy called Don't Mark My Paper, Help Me Get an A. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Ken, we have about 400 clubs in Florida, maybe a little bit more, about 390 of them that belong to the Florida Club Man Association. 
And many of those clubs have hundreds and hundreds of employees. So you're talking thousands of people in the industry. If you were to say one thing to all the leaders in the club business in Florida, that thousands of people of 50 years of expertise, what's the one piece of advice, the one thing that you'd want to share with them to be better leaders? Well, I'd, I'd get our new book. <laughs> it, it summarizes really all the things that Randy and I and our people have been teaching over the years about servant leadership and, and trust. But the, the big thing is that last thing we talked about is it's not about you. Get out of your own way. Don't uh, focus. Uh, look out the window and give people credit. When there's a problem, look in the mirror and say, what could I do to, to yeah. turn this around? Yeah, I love that. Um, Randy, while I, while I read these questions, I have a question for you. Thank you, Tim, for that. You know, you spent 26 years at the Ken Blanchard Companies, and you've been a management consultant for, for almost three decades. Tell us a story of a company that you work with that was before and after. Like, it was maybe a, a self-serving culture, and that you really worked on their leaders to change their hearts and the results that happened because of that. Uh, maybe you don't have to say the name of the company, but maybe give some examples of, of some incredible change that you've witnessed over your 30 years working at the Ken Blanchard companies. Hmm. One that comes to mind is um, we worked for a long time with one of the nation's uh, largest home improvement retailers. So you could probably guess, you know, there's just a few of those, right, that you uh, probably visit every weekend if you uh, are doing any home improvement projects. But um, they uh, were in a situation where all of their internal um, employee surveys and engagement surveys showed that the stores with the lowest levels of trust and engagement were also the stores that not ironically had the lowest levels of profit revenue, right? Uh, they had the highest people costs in terms of injuries on the job, sick days. And they went through a very intentional process of building trust through a process of learning about SL2, our situational approach to managing people. Um, and over the course of time, we're able to shift their culture and as I was writing an article about this uh, several years ago, and I was interviewing one of the senior leaders on the, on the team there, he said, Randy, our, our internal surveys show the change. The stores that have the highest levels of trust and engagement, they're the stores with the highest level of profit, revenue. They have the lowest people cost, you know, in terms of shrink, which is stealing from the store, lowest injuries on the job. And so that work that you put in to invest in your people and in the trust within leadership and in the organization, it's the lifeblood that fuels everything else, right? It's all about, it's all about the heart. It's about who you are as a leader. You know, I think that's, Probably the one thing I've learned most over my career is that leadership is much more about who you are than what you do. If you get it right on the inside, the right values, beliefs, and attitudes, it can't help but leak out into your actions. Yeah, I love it. You got to do the internal work first, and then the outward stuff uh, will flow, and you'll see the results from that. Yeah, you can't really love and serve other people until you really love yourself because they're always going to want the credit and the recognition and they're pointing always to you until you. That, that's right. One of the, one of the simple truths in our book is a quote from uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And he said, self-trust is the first secret to success. Yeah. And, and we look at self-trust as do you trust who you are as a leader? And do you trust in your mission and purpose in life? Are you clear on your own leadership point of view? And if you can trust in that, know that you're serving a bigger purpose in the world, that's, that's your North Star. That's what gets you going in the right direction. And then everything else flows from there. 
Yeah. Um, we received the question from one of the leaders at the Florida Club Man Association. And when I read the question, it broke my heart. Also, it just opened my eyes that I get this question all the time from leaders. And I'd like to ask this question to you, Ken and Randy. Um, this leader was basically saying that he has a, a, a leader that works for him on a senior team, that it's a huge uh, student of, of servant leadership and often quotes Ken Blanchard and other great leaders and walks around, you know, you know professing um, servant leadership. But this, this person actually is incredibly arrogant and not humble at all. And so, you know, when Adam Grant talked about his book, um, give and take, he talks about the three types of people in the world. You're the giver or you're a taker or, or, or the worst is you're a poser. Mm -hmm. I mean, you pose as a giver, but you're actually a taker. It sounds like this person is a, is a poser, someone that's actually posing as a servant leadership, as a servant leader, but actually is a, is a taker. And um, I'd like to get some wisdom how to really you know, approach this person and how do you mentor an arrogant, cocky, self-centered, all about me leader, and how, do you, how do you get them to, to, to drink the Kool-Aid that um, becoming a more humble, genuine, um, soft-spoken, it's not about me leader is far better. How do you, how do you handle a situation like that when you have someone? Well, it, it's, an, it's an interesting charge. You know, my dad who retired as an admiral in the Navy used to say talk is cheap when it takes money to buy whiskey, you know, and, uh, you know, but uh, if you want to really change somebody like that, you first got to know them. Uh, I've seen times where the manager is inconsistent and people go in and confront them and all, and they throw them out of the office because they don't have a relationship. And so I was in a, at a college where the, the uh, dean was a big writer of participative management, but he didn't practice it at all. And I, I agreed with the feedback from the, the faculty, but I needed to first develop a relationship. So I saw him in the halls and I said, George, you've done a lot of writing and I was just getting going. Would you look at a couple of things I've been working on and give me some feedback? Oh, sure, Ken, come on in. And I would go in, he got flip charts and he's showing me uh, this stuff. And about the third meeting we had in my writing, he said to me, Ken, what do you think we should do with the jerks we got in this school? The key comment was, what do you think we should do? Now he saw me on his team and I could give him suggestions on what we could do with the people, but I could also give him suggestions on his own behavior. Because if you give people feedback, you are taking something from your relationship. You need to have something in the barrel first. Otherwise you need a, you know, a gun and a mask. And so first build a relationship with them before you start giving him feedback, don't you think, Randy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, uh, Tommy, you and others have probably heard like the idea of a trust bank account, right? Like in our relationships, we all have an emotional bank account or a trust bank account with others. And sometimes you have to make withdrawals on those. Most of the time we unintentionally, you know, do withdrawals, but sometimes in cases like this where you need to give feedback to someone, as Ken was saying, you first have to look at the relationship. You know, what's the level of trust that I have with this person? Are they, do they have enough trust in me knowing that I have their best interests at heart, that they'll be even open to hearing the feedback from me? If you don't think that they, if you don't think that your bank account has that much capital in it, that's where you need to work first, right? Is building up that bank account. So that when you have to make that withdrawal, you've got plenty in the bank. And if you remember earlier, I said, trust is based on perceptions, which are formed by the behaviors we use. So rather than when you give this person feedback, Dan, Dan, who entered the question there, um, focus on the behaviors, not the person, right? Focus on the behaviors of how their language or their actions don't align with their words rather than, you know, attacking their character. Because uh, that makes it a lot harder for people to hear when they feel like we're giving them feedback on personality characteristics that they can't really change or have as much control over changing, but we can focus on the behaviors that they're using. So that's, that's a place to start. Yeah. 
I'd like to switch key. Thank you for that. that, that I, and then Dan actually texted, thank you. That was very helpful. And uh, I know Dan quite well. He's a great leader. So I know he's going to do some good work to help this um, senior leader um, see the light that becoming humble, a genuine leader is, is the way to, way to go. Um, I'd like to change the, the, the path a little bit to our questions about um, the culture of service. You know, we're in the club business and our job is to serve our members. And, you know, for, for 100 years, you know, country club leaders have been told the members always right. We do everything for the members and it's all about the members, you know, customers king. And, and, we, and, and I think that is still told to 99% of all the, the, the club leaders in the country that, that the members always right and it's all about the members. And then, you know, something happened with Southwest Airlines years ago that said, our customers are not uh, the, 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 the number one. Our customers are not king. And I'll let you tell the answer, who is king? But, you know, in our world, we, we once thought the world was flat. <laughs> we were wrong. Uh, you Google 1960s pregnancy and you see hundreds of women smoking cigarettes when they're pregnant. We had a bill called the three-fifths compromise that a black person's worth three-fifths of a white person. Yeah. Not always gotten it right. right. And I think customer service has gotten it, the same rap is that the customer is not always king. And yeah. it's always about the member. Go into a little bit about the next 10, 20, 30 years of leadership and customer service. And is the customer really king? And who is the most important person in an organization? And where should we be spending our efforts um, as we're leading our organizations? Yeah. Well, Tommy, what, what we have found is that the best organizations, their number one customer is their people. Yeah. If you train your people, you love on your people, you take care of your people, they will go out of your way their way to take care of your second most important customer, the people who use your products and services. And then they will become raving fans of your organization and they'll be part of your sales force and that takes care of the bottom line. And so it, your, your people really have to come first. And so often we were saying customers, 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 and oh, we were beating up our people and wondering why they were leaving or they were abusing our customers. No, you need to make sure your people understand that you really are so important and it's we, not me. And how do we take care of these customers? Because we want to make sure uh, that we are doing the best for each other and them. Yeah, yeah. And, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the member or the customer, that, that saying is always right. The member is always right. Well... Of course, no, the member is not always right, but the member is always the member, right? We have to keep in mind who it is that we're serving. Ken Sun <coughs> is the president of our company and he loves to say, you know, we have to remember 100% of our revenue comes from our customers. And it's like, mm, yeah, that's right. We, we can't lose sight of that. And going back to the power of and results and relationships, as Ken was saying, if you put your people first and invest in them, they will be your best salespeople and serve your members, right? So it's a win-win situation. Um, you know, I was recently in Florida a couple of months ago for our industry uh, conference and I had to be there for an extended period of time. So I took my golf clubs and went to a couple courses while I was out there. And, and I don't know if anyone's on the line who represents any of these courses, but I was able to golf at uh, Celebration, uh, and which is in Kissimmee. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. Kissimmee, Kissimmee, how, how do you pronounce it? Maybe someone will give me the, the phonetic spelling in the chat there. And then I, I played at Shingle Creek in the Orlando area. And um, I have to tell you, like I just had wonderful service. And it was an example of uh, what I see as, uh, you know, servant leaders understand it's not about them as we shared in our final simple truth, right? It's not about you. It's not about you, but it does start with you. It starts with you and you have to be the role model. You have to be the one that embodies what 
humble leadership looks like, what service-oriented leadership looks like. And if you can do that, then that spreads to your people who then spread that to your customers. And so, you know, I think it, Tommy, it gets a little dangerous when, a, when I feel like we start rank ordering who's the most important, you know, because then it can sort of lead people to think, well, you know, if I, as the employee, am the most important, then I really don't have to give my all to the member or the customer that I'm serving. But if we understand that we all have to take personal responsibility to treat everyone we interact with as the most important person in our universe at that moment in time, then, then we sort of get out of that rank ordering stuff and we really put the focus on the other, whoever that other is, right? Our colleague, our member, um, our spouse, whoever it is. Um, so, Thank you, uh, Randy and Ken. When I hear in summarizing, I, what I'm hearing from the two of you is the, that we are, the clubs are there to serve their members. That's, that's their constitution that's right. of serving its members. But the best way to serve their members is to build a culture of putting their people first. And that's, I, right. that's right. Um, thank you, Ken. And thank you, Randy, for taking time out of your morning. Uh, Ken, I know you have to head to the hospital because Margie, your wife, hurt her wrist and I'm praying for her, her recovery and that she's not in too much pain. And Randy, I want to thank you for being such a strong lieutenant to Ken over 26 years. Um, he's worth being loyal to and uh, loyal lieutenants as well. Ken, you're a mentor and a, a dear friend and I love you very much. Thanks for sharing your heart with us this morning. Um, the password for to get credit for today's webinar is trust. And uh, stay tuned for next month for a Heart Led Leader webinar series. Beth and I invited uh, Tim Sanders that wrote Love is a Killer App, which is an incredible book. He was an executive at uh, Yahoo and uh, now has written six or seven books. And he's going to be with us on August 10th at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Thank you, Beth Sargent uh, and the Florida Club Man Association for sponsoring um, these webinar series. Thank you, Ken and Randy for being with us this morning. And we'll see you all back um, on the webinar on August 10th with Tim Sanders. God bless. Bless you all. Great to be with you all. Thank you, Mr. Blanchard. Thank you, Randy. You're welcome. Good to be with you.